I'm Mary Chapman, and I'm the director of the Winifred Eaton Archive. The Winifred Eaton Archive is a fully accessible, freely downloadable digital archive that aims to provide uh, scans and transcriptions of Winifred Eaton Babcock Reeves collected works. So the first archive uh, was hosted at the University of Virginia eTech Center. Many of us of a certain age will remember that, that institution fondly. And it had a few glorious years of being used by teachers and scholars and students. Um, but then, unfortunately, the UVA Tech Center closed down in 2007. So it only had these couple years of um, existence. And at that time, um, the people at UVA Tech Center said, well, well, we'll put everything on our catalog so it's accessible. All the texts are accessible there. Um, but they could no longer host the actual archive website, which provided the, um, the biographical information and the bibliographical information that I had put on the archive. Um, in fact, it was one of the most demoralizing moments, I think, of my career was when they said, well, we'll give you all your files back, and, um, and they sent them to me as a single email attachment as a zip file. So this archive um, suffered the fate of many early recovery projects, early digital recovery projects. And um, Amy Earhart writes about these in her book, um, Traces of the Old, Uses of the New. And she talks about not only this project, but uh, larger ones like Alan Liu's Voice of the Shuttle, Sharon Harris's Early American Women's Website, um, and Tony uh, McNairin and Carol Miller's Voices from the Gaps. But all of these projects um, languished, ended up languishing because uh, there wasn't really anything to sustain them. Uh, many of us were working, um, you know, the only people doing di this kind of digital recovery work at our institutions um, without graduate student support and without a kind of digital media lab that could help maintain and update the site. So Earhart um, in her book really talks about the fact that these projects did a lot of work to decenter and diversify the literary canon in the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, and that momentum kind of ended when um, when attention in digital scholarship kind of retrenched back into a focus on the same canonical writers that had been featured um, in critical editions and scholarly, scholarly editions and reprinted by university presses. And so all the projects that I talked about that I just mentioned really became, in Earhart's words, ghosts on the Wayback Machine. But then Mary came along a couple years ago and, um, and she and her team have just done such a wonderful job putting the archive back together and then make and then doubling it in size, maybe tripling it in size, uh, including all these beautiful images and uh, ancillary materials, um, film clips, and also um, opening it up to new researchers who may bring new materials uh, to our study of this really fascinating writer. I didn't know my grandmother. I have only one memory of meeting her when I was maybe four years old, and I insulted her by calling her my bad grandma. All I knew about her when I was growing up is that she was part Chinese, wrote books about Japan, and was a famous author. Critics have often thought of Winifred Eaton as the bad Eaton sister, because unlike her sister Edith Eaton, who published sympathetic chronicles about diasporic Chinese under the pseudonym Suisin Barr, Winifred published these outrageous tales that were not based on any of her lived experience, but rather based on her imagined idea of Japan. And when I got the opportunity to write the biography, I, I jumped on it with all the drive and energy that my grandmother used, it used to display seemingly hourly in her frenetic, flamboyant life. And through the process of researching and writing, and in fact, learning how to write a biography, I was particularly aided by two then graduate students, Jean Lee Cole and Dominica Ferens, who formed with me a triumvirate of Winniers, as we called ourselves. Winnie took us on a ride and the adventure of a lifetime. But for me, most of all, I discovered uncovered, and met my mysterious eccentric grandmother. Who was she? What was she like? 
Well, she came from poverty and had strong ambition to do great things, but I wouldn't say she had a plan. She chameleoned and flitted from one step to another as the winds of fortune and mishap blew, reacting and using her fertile, teeming brain, as she called it, to invent new ideas, new stories, new situations, and to live them. No biographer ever had a more fascinating subject. Winifred Eaton was an incredibly prolific author. She wrote over 300 works of fiction, poetry, drama, ethnography, journalism, memoir. She even wrote a cookbook. And beginning in the late 19-teens, she was an active contributor of screenplays and scenarios to Hollywood. In fact, she was one of the first women in Hollywood. Eaton's oeuvre is really messy because she lived in so many different locations and she took up different identities and pseudonyms, because her subject matter was so diverse, it was very complicated for us to shape the archive in a usable way. So what we decided to do was organize it around five exhibits that seemed to bring together works that had something in common. So the first section is about early experiments, mostly what she wrote in and about Montreal and Jamaica from about 1895 to 1900. The second section is her plain Japanese career. So from about 1896 to 1922, which is the year she publishes Sunny San, her last Japanese novel. The third section is about her New York years from about 1901 to 1916, but focusing on the text that she wrote that departed from the Japanese masquerade that occupied some of those years. And then the final two sections look at her output while she lived in Alberta, where she championed Canadian literature, wrote about her life living on a ranch with her second husband, and contributed a lot of uh, fiction to Canadian uh, newspapers and magazines. And the final section is devoted to exploring her Hollywood productions film scripts, scenarios, treatments, but also fiction she wrote about the movie industry from about 1916 to 1935. So for each text, we present a facsimile from its original appearance in a publication, as well as a transcription. We also provide, in many cases, head notes that are peer-reviewed and written by some of our volunteers. And there's a lot of metadata as well. And if you hover over the name of an illustrator, for example, you can visit a page that provides a short bio about that illustrator. If you hover over the name of a periodical, you can go to a page that gives more information about that periodical and lists all the texts that Winifred Eaton published in that periodical. But in addition to the five exhibits about the particular phases in her career, the Winifred Eaton Archive also presents an illustrated timeline that corrects some of the errors or gaps in her biography from her birth to her death and beyond. It's illustrated by all kinds of amazing photographs uh, from the families collection. And there's also a list, a complete bibliography, and there are other resources. And our hope is that this archive will continue to expand as newly located works are found, and that it will continue to become more complicated as scholars contribute ideas about how they want to use the archive. So one of the innovations that we've introduced recently is a static search function that allows scholars to search within the archive in a number of different ways. I'm so excited to see what new generations of students and scholars and researchers will be able to do with this site.